Some called it a murdering machine, but the question was, who faced the greatest risk from this Civil War submarine? The enemy or the men operating it? Eight men were jammed side by side in this cramped space, with walls three and a half feet apart and the ceiling about four feet high. It was hot inside the vessel as the men pulled on a crank that moved the propeller. What's worse, these daredevils knew that many men before them had died in this very submarine. The risks of this line of work were extreme, but the men who operated the H.L. Hunley had a chance to be a part of something never done before, sinking an enemy ship with a submarine. Were these men crazy? Were they incredibly brave? Were they a little of both? During the next 10 minutes, you will hear their tale, and you can decide for yourself. If you recall from our previous episode, machinists James R. McClintock and Baxter Watson and their wealthy associate Horace L. Hunley joined the submarine development scene for the Confederacy with their submarines the Pioneer and the Pioneer II, also known as American Diver. Although the three Pioneers tinkered with innovative approaches to submarine operation, they never got to see their vessels in action against an enemy boat as both sunk in non-combat situations. However, McClintock, Watson, and Hunley were undeterred, and they set out to build a third submarine. This time, the trio teamed up with engineer Edgar C. Singer and some of his associates to form the Singer Submersible Corporation. In addition to lessening the financial burden, Singer would be useful in the development process because he specialized in the design and production of torpedoes. With two submarines behind them, McClintock and Watson had hard-earned experience from which to draw in developing their third boat, the H.L. Hunley. According to Mark Reagan in his book, Submarine Warfare in the Civil War, quote, the Hunley was not a rebuilt pioneer. The Louisiana investors had learned much from the two previous vessels they had constructed in 1861 and 1862. And with this experience, they appreciated what worked and what did not. For example, the two machinists did not spend time and money attempting to power their new submarine through an electromagnetic or steam engine. Rather, they set out to maximize the speed and efficiency of the hand crank propeller. They designed the Hunley to have seven men work the crank as opposed to four men in the Pioneer II. They also significantly improved the cranking force that could be generated by using differential gears. Working from their shop in Mobile, Alabama, the Hunley's builders made improvements to its size, weight displacement, ballast tanks, diving planes, controls, and more. As for its offensive capabilities, the Hunley would tow a floating torpedo behind it, and when the submarine sailed beneath its target, the torpedo would make contact with the enemy vessel and explode. All in all, the submarine was 40 feet long, 4 feet tall, and constructed with wrought iron plates. It housed 8 crew members, 1 captain to steer the craft, and 7 men on the crank. In July of 1863, the Hunley began its sea trials. In one test, it blew up an anchored coal barge, impressing the previously skeptical Admiral Franklin Buchanan. Buchanan recommended the submarine to General P.T. Beauregard of Charleston, who was in desperate need of assistance in combating the Union's constricting blockade of the Charleston Harbor. By August 15th, both the Hunley and its owners had arrived in Charleston. While the stakes were high in Charleston, so were the payouts. The Confederacy had a standing agreement that the Hunley's owners would receive half of the value of any vessel they sunk. In addition, one of Charleston's leading businesses offered $100,000, a huge sum at the time, to anyone who could sink either of the Union's most powerful blockading ships, the New Ironsides or the Wabash, as well as $50,000 for any monitor sunk. But at this point, things began to go wrong for the hopeful inventors and their sub. Charleston was in need of fast action. Fort Sumter and Battery Wagner, two forts critical to protecting Charleston's harbor, were under heavy attack from Union forces. However, for some reason, McClintock would not employ the Hunley against any of the Union's ships. Confederate officials soon grew exasperated and impatient. The situation worsened on August 23rd as the Union began shelling the heart of Charleston from their cannons on nearby Morris Island. 
Shortly after, General Beauregard seized the Hunley on behalf of the Confederate Army and ordered it to be manned by a crew of naval officers. But not long after the new crew began taking the submarine out for test trials, tragedy struck. On August 29, just before casting off for another test, the Hunley suddenly sunk to the bottom of Charleston Harbor. Five of the eight crew members drowned in the accident. Conflicting accounts were offered as to the cause of the sinking, one being that the wake of another boat flooded the hatches, another being that Lieutenant Payne accidentally stepped on the dive plane lever, causing the vessel to submerge with its hatches open. If Payne did step on the lever, it would confirm a fear of McClintock's that any crew member not intimately familiar with the workings of the Hunley could disrupt the proper functioning of the submarine. Soon after the sunken submarine was raised, Horace Hunley requested that the boat be put in his charge, which was duly granted. To command the vessel, he chose a young lieutenant named George E. Dixon, who had previous experience with the boat in Mobile. On a day when Dixon had been called away, the Hunley experienced its second tragedy. Hunley took the crew out for a diving exercise and never resurfaced. Everyone in the sub died in the sinking, including Horace Hunley. After recovering the vessel, the Hunley's owners found that the seacock, which allows water into the ballast tank, was still open. It seems Hunley had forgotten to close it after submerging. Because of the two sinkings, the Hunley unfairly took on nicknames like the peripatetic coffin and the murdering machine. However, evidence points to human error as the cause of both sinkings, not any failings of the submarine itself. The challenge ahead was not improving the boat, but finding a captain capable of commanding the craft. And, considering the recent tragedies, someone brave enough. Lieutenant Dixon, whom Hunley had originally chosen to command the vessel, was the man for the job. Dixon, who had fought at Shiloh, one of the Civil War's bloodiest battles, was known for his bravery and self-assuredness. Dixon was there when the recovered submarine was first opened. He saw Hunley's dead body and the bodies of the crew tightly grappled together, their blackened faces expressing despair and agony, as described by General Beauregard. Despite this, Dixon still wanted to remain in command of the vessel. In fact, he had to convince Beauregard to allow them to continue using the Hunley because the general initially wanted nothing more to do with it. Beauregard's one stipulation for the boat was that from then on it would use a spar torpedo to attack the kind used by the notable torpedo boat the David, rather than towing a floating torpedo. Presumably, Beauregard considered this a safer method, since the submarine would have to submerge partially just before attacking. Unlike the David, the Hunley's torpedo would not explode on contact. Instead, it was triggered by a line called a lanyard connected between the torpedo and the boat. The Hunley would ram the torpedo into the enemy ship and then back away. When it reached a safe distance, the lanyard would tighten, triggering the explosive. By the time the boat had been repaired and Dixon found a replacement crew, Battery Wagner had been abandoned and Fort Sumter had been leveled. However, there was still much need for the Hunley services against a Union's crippling blockade. For his target, Dixon chose the USS Housatonic, a powerful Union sloop of war. So, at 7 p.m. on February 17, 1864, a cold and calm night, Dixon and his crew squeezed into the Hunley and set course for the mighty ship. At 8.45 p.m., the Housatonic's officer of the deck, John Crosby, spotted something in the water roughly a hundred yards away. Initially, it appeared to be a porpoise. Crosby soon realized that the object was not a porpoise, and it was coming straight for the Housatonic. He ordered the crew to their battle stations, the anchor chain to be disconnected, and the engine to be put in reverse. Hearing the commotion, Captain Charles W. Pickering ran from his cabin to the deck. On Pickering's orders, the crew began to open fire on the Hunley. By the time the crew had prepared the ship's big guns, the submarine was too close to the Housatonic for them to train the guns down on it. Then, there was a thud. Shots began to ring out again as the Hunley backed away from the Housatonic. Then a deafening explosion cut through the air. The ship heaved and black smoke rose to the sky. The Housatonic began to sink immediately. Within five minutes of the blast, 
the big ship had sunk to the bottom of Charleston Harbor. However, because it was anchored in shallow water, the crew was able to find safety above water in the ship's rigging. Only five of the ship's 160 crew members died from the encounter. Eventually, a nearby Union ship, the USS Canandaigua, approached the Housatonic, and the crew was rescued. For the crew in the Hunley, though, this was a victory, a historic achievement. But the celebration couldn't have lasted long. The Hunley never made it back to its base on Sullivan's Island. It sank without a trace. Back in Charleston, no one knew what had happened to the sub, and it remains a mystery to this day. At the time, a number of theories were proposed. Perhaps it sunk from the explosion of the torpedo. Perhaps the gunfire from the Housatonic damaged the glass in one of the hatches. Perhaps the submarine had a run-in with the Yankee ship, the Canandaigua. One critical piece of evidence was a small blue light. The blue light is assumed to be the prearranged signal communicating that the Hunley was returning to its base. This signal was sighted by a lookout on the Housatonic as they waited for the Canandaigua to rescue them. The blue signal was also reportedly observed by the officers at its base, Battery Marshal. This suggests that the Hunley had survived the engagement and was on its way back when it sunk. For 131 years, the Hunley remained at the bottom of Charleston Harbor. But in 1995, Adventure author Clive Cussler, along with a team from the National Underwater and Marine Agency, made one of the great nautical finds. By dragging a magnetometer through the water, they discovered a submarine covered with silt at the bottom of the harbor. It was the Hunley. The question then became, how to raise the Civil War submarine without harming it? They came up with an ingenious system that cushioned the sub as it was raised to the cheers of a crowd on August 8, 2000. The discovery of the ship shed a little more light on the mystery of what happened, but offered no definitive answers. When the divers found the Hunley, it was pointed towards Sullivan's Island, further corroborating the theory that it was on its way back when it sunk. However, the boat showed no major damage from gunfire or from any sort of collision. We still don't know exactly what happened to the Hunley on that night. The Hunley's achievement proved too little too late for the Confederacy. It was never able to break the Union's blockade in Charleston Harbor. Exactly a year after the Hunley sunk the Housatonic, General Beauregard, surrounded and outnumbered, ordered his forces to evacuate Charleston. The Union took the city the next morning. Two months after that, General Robert E. Lee surrendered to the Union at Appomattox. While the Hunley's efforts ultimately proved fruitless for the Confederate war effort, something we can be thankful for today, it greatly impacted naval warfare technology by laying the groundwork for future submarine builders. In 1958, Rear Admiral Frederick B. Walder, skipper of the Nautilus, the first atomic-powered submarine, commented on the Hunley's impact. He said, quote, We in submarines owe Hunley a great deal. True, her imperfections were many, and her success in combat scant and fatal, but she set a precedent of world-shaking consequence. By sinking that Union ship, Hunley demonstrated that a ship could veil herself in the underwater world and, through the element of surprise, deal an enemy a deadly blow. To recap, after the failure of their first two submarines and many trials with their third, McClintock, Watson, and Hunley made history by producing the first submarine ever to sink an enemy ship. Despite the submarine sinking and the eventual capture of Charleston, the H.L. Hunley served as a forerunner for submarines of the future. You can also read about one of the Confederacy's early submarines and the thrilling story of a northern spy's attempt to gather intelligence on the secret vessel in History by the Slice co-producer Doug Peterson's novel, The Lincoln League. You can find the book online at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. We hope you enjoyed this slice of history. Until next time.